you can. Thank you. Uh, so welcome. I'm glad so many of you came, even on Sunday afternoon. So let's get right up to it. Uh, first thing is that today I look, looked at my team and I thought like, that's not clear. That's that's not what I want to do. So this is like better title. Hold on. Okay. So this is better title for my talk. Like we are trying to get all the data, but we'll get there. We got quite a journey ahead of us, so let's get straight into it. So as it was said, my name is Martin Strapko. I worked as a game analyst at Salens for two years. Salens is a company that focuses on business intelligence and analytics for various game developers and publishers. We're working with quite a lot of different uh, game companies. And during this time, we found out that there's a market for something special. And that special is a big data attribution platform. So we found it BuffPunnel, which is a Steam marketing analytics platform that we, we found it. And there I am currently employed as an integration engineer. So this is like a quick sample of our clients. So we worked, for example, with Hill Climb Racing 2. Who of you know what is Hill Climb Racing 2? Please raise your hand. OK, that's quite a lot. So it was actually number one downloaded application in both App Store and Android uh, uh, Google Play in December 2016. There are some other companies. There is like a huge list, but that's not important right now. What is important is that what we do. So we are trying to make data-driven decisions instead of instinct ones. So we are trying to look at the data, find out what is wrong and how it can be improved. We also do in-depth analytics. For example, we are trying to find out how certain players behave depending on where they're co coming from, what age they are, or anything else we can find out. Basically, it can be summed up to more data we have, better decisions we can make. So for this, we are trying to extract data from all the third-party services that our clients are using to incorporate it in our analysis. To do this, we have to transform the data to meet the requirements of our client or our own for our analysis. And at the end, we are most likely loading it into our client's database for them to later use it or to compare it in the future with how the game progressed, how it improved. So we are doing it, doing it through an APIs. APIs or application programming interfaces is a set of clearly defined methods to, for various software companies to talk to each other, basically, to share data. There are many use cases in computer science to use this kind of APIs, but today we will talk about only one of them, is the web APIs, so talking with a web application, web server, databases up, up there somewhere. There are also different types of data we are interested in. For example, the most common case is aggregated data that we use for our analysis. Each service usually has its own format of how they provide the data. For example, Chartboost, an ad provider, uh, gives us metrics such as impressions, how many uh, people actually saw the ad. Or just Steam reviews, like what did the player said about the game? Did they recommend it, not recommend it, why? So these are all data that are interesting to us. There is also the other kind, something I call the stream data. And we are caching it, why? Because the stream data are usually available only for a short time or like instantaneous. For example, price of game on Steam. You can ask what is the price right now. That's not a problem. But asking what was the price a week ago, well, that's not exactly possible. However, we, are, we know this and so we are prepared for it. And every few hours, for example, we are querying the price of all the games that we are interested in and we are storing it in our own database for later on to look up. So this was like really short introduction. This is basically the chart of how this all works. And you might notice that it is somehow empty. <clears throat> and I'm going to fill it up during this presentation. So, but before we start doing that, let's sprinkle in some code quality. Like things that we learned that we knew that we should do, but we didn't believe it until we needed it. So first thing is that uh, just because I'm a programmer, I create a program, it doesn't mean that I'll be the one using it. Often, the user of the program is our analyst or somebody else who do not know 
like how Python works, or he do not want to know how Python works, and he don't, he don't want to find things in there and edit them when he needs to. So we need some kind of way to uh, change the script's behavior outside of the code. There are two ways to do this. For example, one is a configuration file. So we input uh, some values into the file, and the Python script will read it and use it throughout, the, uh, throughout the, his evaluation. For example, the access keys to the services that we use, or the output destination, etc. Arguments, on the other hand, they might be used for other data that need to change with every invocation of a script. For example, I want to run the script for, for the last week or last month. I want to input like the starting date, the end date, and I want script to get me all the data between these dates. Or some of the standard ones uh, used in many Unix uh, applications is just the version and the help. Those two are really helpful also. Thankfully for Python, there, is like, there are great modules for this. The config parser and option parser, they are really easy to use. I recommend it quite a lot. One thing I want to mention to the configuration file. I, I said that they are often used to store API keys or access keys to the, store, to the sites we are visiting and taking our data from there. From there. Do not commit these values, with pro, like production values of these keys, into your VCS. And with that, I have a question. Who actually did that by accident any time? OK, that's not that much. Well, we should get, get good. So this is a very simple uh, example how it might look. On the left side, you see a snippet of configuration file and a few lines that read it. On the right side, there is a way to, like, for example, introduce the start date and end date to your program. Another thing is that when somebody else uses your program, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Just, that's just a fact. You cannot do anything with that. But what you can do, you can uh, make your job easier debugging it. So log. Log everything that your program does. Every time before you do any operation, after you do operation, write down into a file that you are done or there was an error and, you, and this was what happened. Because next time your analyst calls you like, yeah, dude, I'm missing data from last week. What happened? Like, I don't know. It worked. Well, you can look it up and you find out that he had wrong API keys, for example, and other things. Also, there might be some things that are not on your site. So, for example, there was somebody from Island Islands who has like great Unicode symbol in their, in their names. And like, yeah, maybe your program wasn't ready for Unicode names. Or the service was just unavailable. So yeah, it might happen. And it is good to know what happened. So you know if you really, really need to fix your script or it's just somebody else's fault. And the last thing is that, yeah, you have a script, for example, taking data from Steam or so, but are you the one who is going to run the script every hour or at 3 o'clock in the morning every, every day, even on weekends? Well, probably not. And well, nobody got time, got time for that. So there are two solutions. The Unix way, well, probably most of you know, is called cron. You just uh, put there how often you want the script run, and then the, the uh, command line uh, arguments or so to run the script, and it will go every few hours or every three days or so. Or there is a Python solution called Celery. There were like many talks yesterday about Celery, so what the talks. OK, that's just some random stuff around. Let's get to the extracting the data. So as I mentioned, we are going to work with the web APIs. So to talk with the web API, we will do uh, HTTP requests. Thanks to Python, there is also a library called Re Request. I recommend using it. It's very simple. You can do get, pause, request, even the others, but that are not interested to us because they usually change data rather than like only get them. Also, in, in this module, there is also functionality to parse the JSON into Python objects, so you can work with it very easily, or just parsing the CSV. There's a mo module for that also. Great. One last thing I want to mention is that occasionally the service itself provides you with an SDK. 
for example, Google, Amazon, they have their own SDKs in Python and other languages to use with their services. And the need of constructing the request is on, on them, not on you. And you can just call method. However, documentation is sometimes lacking and you might get lost and, uh, about like what is available to you. And there's an awesome function for this in Python. It's called dir that prints out all the properties and methods of an object in Python. Really great to explore the SDKs and find out what they can do. And as I'm say, tell, telling you this is that knowledge is power. So more you know about the API, better it is. Thankfully, every API has a clearly written up-to-date documentation. Also, the services that provide you with similar data have similar APIs. Yeah, that would be great, right? Unfortunately, that's not true. Often developers are like lazy to update documentation or they just like don't think that it is necessary, like nobody will use this API, right? Eh, no, wrong. And with this, each uh, implementation is an adventure on its own. So just buckle up and be ready to whoever is engineer something through trial and error, just send a request, find out what's the answer, try something different to get the result you want. Often the APIs can do a lot much, much more than just what is written in documentation. So be sure to explore it. Another thing is authentication. So proving that we are the ones that are trying to access the data. Because a lot of data is actually uh, like private. The companies do not want to like, tell you how much users they get each month. It's like, that's not a thing that you, you can access by default. But of course, there are some that can you can tell you something like publicly without even like authorizing you yourself. So for example, getting price on Steam. Common example. You can just query it no matter no matter who you are, where you are, or what you want with it, you can just get it. No problem. Then there are simple uh authentications. They're very often with some like with services such as ad providers, etc. And they create an access key for you as a user with which, which you can query your data and find out how your ads are actually performing. Or there are some API keys, which is a little bit different than an access key because you can create API key for each application that touches the data on the service, for example, and then you can individually control whether the API key is still valid or like disable it. Often this, this kind of author, uh, authentication is done through an authorization header in the HTTP request. And the last, but not, not least, I guess, is OAuth 2. Very common with big providers such as Amazon, Google, Facebook, everyone. And it is like really great, really secure, and really complex. And I don't want to get to detail, but the only thing I want to mention is the very awesome redirect URI I value you can see up there. And what it does is that it tells the service to not redirect user somewhere to your website because your website is not existent. It's just a script from server. But to give the value that is necessary for script to continue to the user so he can manually input it into a terminal and continue with the authentication. <clears throat> OK, so that is awesome. We can make requests. But it is not OK to like go right now and make like 1,000 requests per second on every API just because you want all the data from Steam or something like that. They don't usually like it. They will IP ban you or you, can, you might like DDoS the API for, for quite a while by accident. And also certain APIs, especially those that provide you with aggregated data, data might be calculated only 20 times a day. So they allow you only 20 requests per day because there's no reason to query it more often. So be sure that you know these limits from documentation or just by testing it. And cache the data when you are preparing for the other stages of the ETL we are doing right now. Because uh, you don't want to waste your request just to try out the transformation, even though the data you get is the same. So there are also ways to circumvent these limits, but I don't want to talk about it right now. It's kind of dark magic, but it can be done. Yeah, and the red leads is actually based on a true story. So take care. Um, yeah, so we added a part to the chart. Great. Oh. 
Okay, let's continue. So now we have the data, what we did. As I said, we want to do some kind of analysis from it or so. But I also said that the response we get varies from service to service. Even the, even they, they provide the same data. For example, very simple, your client wants to know the return of his investment. Are the ads that I'm, I paid for like good for us? Are they actually earning money? Well, let's see. We have two providers that give us ads. Service A, when we ask the API for the values, it gives us money spent and money earned. So that's easy to calculate. We just like, make a difference from these two values. But service B, they don't actually have money spent, money, money earned in the API. They just have the impressions, cost per impression, and the installs. But that's OK. We can like, calculate from there. That's like, easy math. But we have to do that. And this is something that takes quite a lot of time to like, synchronize 13 different APIs just to have one table where you have all the data. So have fun with that. Also, you have to think about like, what is your target format? What do you want to output? Do you want to output JSON so you can further on have other scripts that access the data and do some other magic on it? Or do you want just a CSV to give it to an analyst and he can do his Excel magic on it? Well, that depends on you. But for both of these, Python has an answer. The JSON and CSV modules are really great and easy to use. So yeah, that was quick. So the last thing is load. Um, load doesn't necessarily mean like just load it somewhere, but you can like use it immediately. For example, as I mentioned, the CSV. You can give it to your analyst, he will data mine it, he will find something in there, or he can make a predictions from it. Or you can make just a simple sna snapshot, like these were the values one month ago. And in a month, we can like try out our, uh, is the game better? Are we like improving somehow? Well, we can compare now the snapshots of a metrics, for example. Or very often used in our case, was a previous day comparison. Like week to week reports how the game is actually changing. And what we did with this, we actually sent an email to analyst or the CEO of a company like, yeah, these are the new values, these are the last, uh, last week's values, this is comparison, good, bad, your choice. There are awesome services to do this for you. You don't have to set up your own SMTP server. You can use just Mailgun or Mail MailChimp. Very simple to use. You just make a pause request. That's like really easy. You just made one to get the data, so why not? Or as the load, na load name would suggest, you can store it for further processing. So either import it to different service that manages all the analytics for you, <coughs> explain or so, and or you can just put it into your own database. Either SQLite, Postgres, Mongo, or so. Our clients have quite a lot of data, so we use BigQuery. You can see a very small snippet on how to load in CSV into BigQuery. So that's basically it. This is the pipeline we are working with quite a lot to improve uh, our customers' games. So to get all the data we want from all the APIs and use it in our analysis. Some bonus things I want to mention is that there are some services that they don't have some kind of API. You cannot do like slash API or something like that. And they like don't want you to get data, but of course the, even the web HTML can be get from a get request. For example, that's pycon.sk. And so this allows you to something called the scrape data. For example, from a Steam, you can scrape time remaining on a sale or something like this, just query the page, you get the HTML, you can parse it with, again, another Python module called Beautiful Soup, and get what you want, then store it somewhere, and do whatever you want with it. Also, this somehow was, there was an implication to have a server that will be running the request, because you don't want to uh, run it from a local server, of course. But why pay for 24-7 server having somewhere sleeping and just once a day make few requests? Well, you can have it on the cloud. For example, the Amazon and Google Cloud and like the buzzword server architecture is very popular nowadays, and you can create it as a Lambda function. So a functions, function that will be called every now and then, it just calls the functions, runs your, your script to get the API, store it into the database that takes like a few minutes, and then it just goes to sleep and wakes up next day. 
and you just pay for the time it, it was actually running. So it is really great, it, it is really easy to set up, and you can even try it for free on Amazon, for example, to have some kind of these scripts to get the data for you. So that is actually all I wanted to talk to, talk to you about. So if you are anyhow interested in these kind of things or do you like games and data in general, we are actually hiring. So come talk to me if you want and hope to see you somewhere else on other PyCon. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have some questions there. Uh, first one is uh, like where is Solens uh, based? Okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, we are based, uh, most of our team is here in Bratislava. We also have a few guys in Prague and our CEO actually is in Sweden. So. Cool, thanks. Uh, so which XML process library um, do you consider the best? Like LXML, Beautiful Soup, uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, we didn't try that much libraries for XML. Uh, we like, really, really like the beautiful soup. Very often, we were just really lazy to find a library for that, and we just parsed it as a string and found like regex somewhere in there, and that parsed. So beautiful is, soup is great, I think. Mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. try a lot of the different. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what do you need uh, to start using uh, Amazon Web Service uh, Lambda functions? Yeah, you need to create an account that might require a credit card, I guess. And then you just need your Python code. You upload it there through zip file, I, I think, and that's it. Then it is running, and you can just set it up to listen to uh, something called an alarm in AVS, where you set it up to do it every X minutes, for example, or every Thursday at 3 o'clock. So very easy. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question is like uh, similar there, but uh, what amount of uh, data do you need uh, for the big query uh, to be viable, to be useful to use it? Um, we are actually processing like, whew, I don't know the number, like 50 or 100 million millions events per day for one of the games. So that's where BigQuery has like, is saving a lot of money. But the minimum to have it like viable to be a good choice, I really can't say. We didn't like experience it. Oh, okay, that's quite a lot still. Thanks. Uh, I think this was a really nice talk. Thank you for that. Okay, thank you.